came back with no ego. I came back with nothing. I just came back raw and just living life. And I think that was the most liberating aspect of it all is once you, once like this is for all entrepreneurs, even no F entrepreneurship, just as humans, when you leave your ego at the door and just like add value or just look at life what it is, life becomes less complicated. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated on providing you the how-tos of marketing and networking strategies. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. All right. Hey, good people. Michelle Gomez. Welcome back to the Networking with Michelle show. Today's special guest is a new best friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Greg E. Hill, fellow podcaster of the Minority Trailblazer podcast. And uh, we just recently connected. I've been following his journey for maybe about a year on LinkedIn, and we recently jumped on the phone. He has some amazing things in the work. So I'm excited to hear everything in store, past and present, as well as future. So, Greg, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Man, I'm pumped up. I'm excited. You already know, man. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to be on the show. And I want to say thank you personally for making time because I know schedules have been realigned, but you've constantly been a value add. And I know hopefully on the theme of this call, theme of this this podcast is adding value. And immediately since talking out to you and you reached out, you've always consistently been, how can I add value? How can I help? Let me reach out. And you follow through on that. So I'm glad that I can finally be able to add value to your listeners and just have a fruitful dialogue and conversation. Yes. So I'm just excited to be talking to you, I guess, on a more personal level, uh, personal interview, because we've discussed some business things or just fellow podcasting things, which is always exciting to go down that lane. Uh, but for those that don't know, how did Greg get his start? All right, cool. I'm going to give you the long, short version, right? Because I got I got to do my due diligence, man, for the, for those that are listening. Because many of you, when you see this on LinkedIn, you're going to be like, yo, I've been seeing him on my feed lately, man. The last couple months, he's been on a roll. Let, don't get confused. It's been 13 years in the making. So I would jump right to the beginning. Um, I'm born in Virginia Beach, single parent household until eight years old. That is when uh my father, my stepfather, but I call him my father, John White, stepped into my life. Military background. Nobody in my family went to college. But uh, my mom gave me that the Southern genuine chill principle. My dad just gave me discipline, uh, gave me the yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and just gave me that that respect and that communication piece, which definitely plays into my life today. My major inflection point came my sophomore year in high school. I was one of them kids that my mom gave me lunch money and I was spending it in the first two days. Like <laughs> I was the guy that, yo, my mom gave me 20 first two days. I'm cashing now. I'm letting people hold dollars. I'm doing this. And then Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, I'm sick. So one one uh one weekday we were in Sam's Club, she had gave me my lunch money. I saw Gatorades. And I mind you, this is at the time where I, at my school Gatorades were getting sold for like seven dollar uh, twenty-five for like the sixteen, no, the twelve ounce. So I saw this twenty-four pack for twelve dollars. And I was like, yo, I buy these Gatorades, I sell them for a dollar, I can make this money. So I got my little rolling book bag and I rolled it into my gym class that day. I sold out. Boom. So I did that for a week and I got I made a little money, but I said, I went to food line one day. I was like, yo, they got the two six packs for 12 for four dollars. And I said, the profit margin on sodas is better. Plus, I could fit more in my duffel bag. Right. So I did that one day, sold out again. And then I realized, like, hold up, my friends, they're going to go to that same food line. And then they're going to be like, yo, I can, they're going to spend their own money doing it because it was cheap. So I said, hold up, uh-uh, you're not going to give me to the punch. So I got my friends together and I gave them 20 percent. And long story short, we had it ended up being like 10 people. Selling sodas, I made a hundred dollars a day. Mind you, I didn't have a car at the time, so my my uh, my best friend Jamal Wardlaw, shout out to him. I had ten duffel bags and his 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 Honda CRZ, small car, and ten duffel bags every single day. People would come up, grab the duffel bag in a day, drop off. I give them twenty percent, and that's got that's kind of my first foray into things. Uh, once the school shut that down, so shout out to me at. 15 shutting down Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola won't make no money. So they said they had to uh had to close it down. And then I used that money to import polos from China because I graduated high school in 07. So I, I went to dhgate.com, found it out. This is when dial up internet was art rocking. And I said, F it. We just gonna find it out. I, I imported them for six dollars a pair, sold them for 20. So by the time I went to North Carolina AT in uh, 2007, I already had a couple thousand saved up from that hustle. Uh side note, funny story. Actually, I, I tried to hustle 
I never told this story live, but I tried to hustle. If you read my book, then you 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 find out. But I tried to hustle, uh, buy some iPhones, right? iPhone threes when they first came out from China, and I tried to get, I tried to go straight to the source. Like I've always, I've been heavily influenced by movies and Frank Lucas, so I said, "F it, let me go straight to the source in China." So I didn't, I didn't go the uh, the DHD. I went to an actual like the China vendor. Man, I bought five iPhones to fifteen hundred because they were re- retailing on like eBay for seven fifty. Yo, I never received them. So I just lost like 1500 just all like that off that. So, I mean, I've lost a lot doing that, but I learned a, a valuable lesson. Like, okay, when something's working, stay, stay within that, that lane, right? Like DHA was working. I try to get greedy and just go straight to the source knowing that there's an international, there's no international trade agreement in China. So if they send it to me, it's on goodwill. If they don't, I can't sue them. So, um, that's neither here nor there. And then A&T sophomore year had a three, six GPA. I was killing it. But I was very raw, right? I was very raw. And, and I'm getting somewhere with this, but I always try to put context, right? So context, very raw. And I was like, yo, I need to join a fraternity because the the, the alphas I saw on campus had were valedictorians. They were, they were doing a lot of great stuff. So I was like, uh, let me join them, man. And joining that fraternity, man, they, they changed my life. I got a chance to th- join the MLT program, which put me in the leagues of people that went to Harvard, Yale, black people that were doing great stuff, A, that gave me confidence because, yo, I was doing stuff on a high level. And I was like, yo, they just like me. And half of them are smarter than anyway. So I was like, okay, we can compete with the big dogs, but also gave me inspiration because cats had companies, cats were investing in stocks, doing real estate, interning for NASA in high school. So I was like, okay, I was hungry too. And that just gave me the corporate polish because, I mean, I didn't know corporate America. I didn't know how to move. My parents didn't operate in that space. So for a couple of years, I had internships with Johnson & Johnson, General Electric, so junior year, started my company, joined me in entertainment, joined me in entertainment in four years. We grossed a hundred thousand dollars gross keyword gross. We netted <laughs> negative 20,000. So I spent a hundred twenty thousand, <laughs> but, uh, it all, it all came to fruition. My senior year, I'm a big reader, read Steve jobs, read all these biographies. And I was like, yo, F it at 20 years old. I said, yo, I'm on that path too. So I said, I don't need school no more. So I left school at 20 years old, went out in the world. Uh, I was interning for the mayor. Join me in the team. was doing well. We had join me at the polls and all this stuff. You can go on YouTube and verify. Like I document everything. Nothing I'm saying is a stretch. And one night I lost twenty thousand dollars in 2011. Twenty thousand dollars, five thousand in loans, five thousand in credit cards, five thousand of my own money, and five thousand from an investor. And that's when I hit rock bottom. And many of you, if you seen me on LinkedIn, I tell the story about being homeless, seven years to graduate. That's the key moment. Made a bad investment. Worked with the wrong people. And um, I was suicidal for a whole year. I just went through a lot of stuff. Uh, and it was a very, very rough time in my life. Up until that point, I've been the golden child. I was the guy, uh, the dark skinned golden child. The guy that could do I was face of campus, was a guy that was always innovative, doing stuff. And then it had that, that failure in my eyes on my record. Mentally, I just couldn't cope. People after me for money. Um, I mean, it was a lot of just, you know, the nightlife round. That's like, I wasn't about that life, but I was in that life. So. It was a very, very tough transition. And then once I went back to school, my pride was so high because I didn't know how to articulate my story. So, shoot, I was homeless for a year, sleeping in cars, sleeping in libraries. Luckily, shout out to Eric Glover, Messiah Davis, um, and uh, Louis Moudreau for allowing me to sleep on the couch for that whole semester. Uh, This was in 2012. So for a whole year, slept on the couch, Um, had like one pair of jeans, three shirts, had two haircuts that whole year. One of the most liberating experiences of my life, but it just, it just, it humbled me so, so much. I needed that because I mean, I, I had a sense of arrogance because I was the guy that could do, do it all for the most part. So that give, that gave, gave me what I need. So I've had the benefit of living the life of a, a hustler, a grinder, but also like not eating for days, weeks, um, struggling, like just, just, but then being liberated by it. Like I was cool walking. I was wearing the same thing every day, but it was cool. Uh, fast forward to, and I'm, I'm giving you this drawn out journey, but I just wanted to really paint the picture because I think, so I don't want anybody to get it twisted. So then we, uh, then, then, okay. After that I graduated. So it took me seven years to get a four year degree. Mind you only had a semester worth of classes. So do the math. It took me three years to do a semester worth of classes. I intern. I mean, I worked for BAE Systems full time. Then I started. I said, "Yo, I want to tell my story" because I was in too many situations where I was around people, and they couldn't know how to react around me because I was on. They didn't see me for a whole year, and then all of a sudden, them and their presence. They're like, "What happened?" I, so I was like, "Oh, how can I own this narrative?" 
I could just make a long, drawn out Facebook post. But I was like, uh-uh, we ain't gonna do that. I ain't gonna give Facebook all that love. Let me drop a site. Let me drop a book on them. Let me own the narrative. So I wrote the first book. Uh, I said, I'm a professional speaker. Then for the last four years, I've been in and out of entrepreneurship and going back to corporate because I didn't know the models. And I, I can't wait to kind of get into the nitty gritty of this this uh, this podcast because, I mean, of course, y'all see the narrative story, but everything I do is strategic. There's models to everything. And I didn't know the models. So I didn't know how to work in this. I didn't know how to speak industry work. Had the raw talent, had the skill, didn't know how to work, didn't know how to book publish the industry work. But every time I went back to corporate after I lost some of my money being an entrepreneur, I went back to corporate. I added something else. We added the next book. The next book was so much better. We added the podcast. We added the consultant. Every single time, I just kept getting better and better and better, even though I still wasn't seeing no money, but I was getting better just working in the dark, working in the dark, working in the dark. And now, to this, to this day, quarter million downloads there, 200, 200, 200 countries later, speaking at colleges, some corporate, but hitting high schools later, um, and just coaching and consulting. I don't really do that like that. That's not really my thing. I, I do, but the price point is going to be high because um, it's just, that's not my thing. Uh, my daughter trouble is a conference coming soon, live tour coming soon. All this because I spent so much time, 13 years in the lab, doing it wrong, learning the wrong way and just, just honing the skill. And now I'm an effing monster. Like just, just, just nobody, I'll say it, I'll say it on, on, on live podcasts at this level where I'm at and of seeing, seeing the competition, I done, I done had so many scars in this game. My intensity, my focus, my, my, my skill set is not, there's nobody in this lane that, that has it like that. Cause I, I, I hit the wall, I hit the wall so hard so many times. So, but I'm using all these things to share as much as I can be the living blueprint to everything, um, that I would like to see for the world. Let me live it and let me be that blueprint because sometimes in society, specifically us as of color, we don't tell, okay, you know, the game, I, if you want to start a podcast, I'd be like, well, just work hard, be consistent. No, you know, you need to. I don't know. I'm going to tell you, you need to have three episodes already in, in the pocket. Get your rating reviews up. Here's a strategy how to launch correctly. You need to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to tell you that. Other people won't because they just scared of the pot. I'm going to tell you that. But now I want to hand it back to you. I guarantee I won't be that l- long-winded on everything else, but I just wanted to paint that picture. Yeah. So I like how you say owning the narrative. And it's actually, um, I'm working on my book right now called Remaining True to My Narrative um, because everyone has a story. and I mean, that's how we relate to people. Just It's just the basis of relationships. But I want to go back to uh, that point when you were homeless and you decided to go back to college. How difficult was that for you at that time? Because you're seeing classmates that you initially started with. They probably, probably already graduated. They've already moved on. They're establishing their careers. And like, how were you measuring yourself at that time? That's a great question. I think the easiest way for me personally was I ain't had no phone, no Wi-Fi anyways. I ain't have a phone for a year, so I didn't get a chance to see what anybody was doing. I was in my own world. Like I was in Durham, North Carolina. Even when I got back in the I didn't have no money. Like people don't when when I when they when I say I was I this is I lived it. I ain't had no money. I I couldn't afford a phone. I ain't had no service. I ain't had no Wi Fi. So I wasn't hip to anybody else. And I always had a focus, even to this day. Now I'm a little bit more aware, but I don't really watch other people's moves like that. Um, I now, I mean, I do now because from a marketing perspective, but it was, it was, it was easy in that sense. And plus, during that time, that whole year, I was writing letters to my friends and family. Um, I was just doing a lot of introspective soul searching, and it was a very, very difficult being back in that space. But when I did it, I came back with no ego. I came back with nothing. I just came back raw. And just living life. And I think that was the most liberating aspect of it all is once you once like this is for all entrepreneurs, even no F entrepreneurship, just as humans, when you leave your ego at the door and just like add value or just look at life what it is, life becomes less complicated. Like you're not I'm not angling it in nothing. I'm not trying to pitch nothing. It's just like it is what it is. And that's what it taught me. It was very, 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 very difficult, but I had to do it because I, I needed it. I needed that. I needed that experience because now I can relate. Like now I see it, but now I can relate to anybody. I can relate to somebody on the street. I can relate to somebody that is doing well. So I have that. I have that that depth. But it was very, very, very difficult. But it's, it's luckily I um, I, I had no phone to really uh, compare anybody. And plus, in the end of the day, I always had the belief that I was going to be a legend regardless. 
So I had faith. Even when I was going through, even how suicide, I said, I, God, I had faith. So I wasn't concerned with anybody else was doing because I know me at full capacity. I, 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 I can't, nobody can stop what God had planned for me. So I was going to dominate anyway. So I'm cool. So you believe you're a born leader and entrepreneur? I'm a learning leader. Uh, I'm always, I just say anything. I'm always evolving. Entrepreneurship. I'm just, a, I'm just a people guy. Uh, I'm just, I'm just adding on the entrepreneurship thing. But I'm just a, I'm just a creator. I'm an executor. That's all I do. I wouldn't even put the entrepreneurship term on me. That's not, that's, that's sexy now. It's in vogue. But I just try to execute and communicate because I know my gift. My gift is not business. My gift is not hustle. My gift is people, vulnerability, communication, and just energy. That's a gift. And I try to bring that in every single thing I do. And even if I fail, even if I don't blow up, even if I'm not considered one of the best under 30, which I am pound for pound in the speaking game, whatever, it's okay. Cause I'm leaving it all on the court. I'm creating and I'm just trying to add value. So um, I live and I die by that. How important is it to be an authentic leader since, you know, since it's an evolving process, right? You're still, you're always learning. I was speaking from a, from two sides. From a business perspective, that's the only way you're going to win nowadays. Millennials don't, people like with social media and whatnot, you can get called out if you're doing some fraudulent stuff. You can get called out so easily. Like you can't hide no more. 10 years, 20 years ago, people can hide behind like um, phony pictures. They can hide behind like fluff reviews. You can hide, but you can't hide no more. People going to find out if you real, if you're not. People going to find out if you really did this stuff. Like, there's no way to hide. So from a business perspective, that, that's the only way as far as to be authentic in every realm. Because, A, you won't keep your employees engaged and happy if you're not authentic, if they don't feel connected. Um, and, B, from a strategic standpoint, it's easier to stand out when you're 100% real. That's the only reason why I'm, I'm starting to create separation from everybody else in this game. Not because I'm that much deeper. It's because I'm real. I'll tell you, I, two years ago or a year ago, I only had $35 in my bank account when I was putting this podcast together. I'll tell you that when I went on tour, I didn't get this self-funded tour. I ain't had no money to do tour. I put out the pre sales before the tour was even ready. My book, I sold 100 copies of a book before I even wrote the book. I ain't had no money to do this. The conference, the Minority the Trailblazer Conference that's going on in March that I just booked the Durham, through God, of course, just booked the Durham Convention Center. I ain't had no budget, no money to do that. I ain't no sponsors backing me. But we just led by faith and put it out there. So I, nobody else is that raw. Everybody else want to sit beside and have cool pictures and grandstand and act like everything's OK. No, 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 no. And that's my separation. So authenticity from a personal perspective is that's my brand. So I built like that. Boom. And from a business perspective, that's the only way you're going to create separation in your market is by owning your difference. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and another thing you said previously I mean, you're an executor, right? X, Y, Z. And I believe when we get to the online marketing, online business space, you know, uh, there is a lot of fluff. It's, it's you know, you got to be passionate and you, you just got to do it, you know, follow your heart. And it's like, well, I, I need to know how. Yeah. Where do I start? I mean, I know you said some things that separate you, but I, I really believe the value is in how, in the how. But like, why is that getting lost in translation now? Like when it comes, it's like people, I don't know, like there's a group of people that think it's secret, but then they want to brag about it on social media. What's that about? Um, I think if I'm answering your, your, your question correctly, I believe the biggest, biggest thing is, to be honest, a lot of people really don't want to start. That's why they that's why they take these courses. That's why they listen to all these podcasts. That's why they read all these books. That's why they ask people for their opinions. The core, bold, naked truth. A lot of people don't want to start because they want to live in the the myth world of I could do this. I, I probably could. Um, I probably should. It's easier to stand behind a veil and be like, yo, if I try hard, I could do that. Or if they, if I had those advantages, those resources, I could do that. It's easier to take those courses and go through your business plan and whatnot. It's, it's that, to be honest, that's what's real. But if you really want to go out there and do it, you just gotta put it out, like, and find your one thing. Find your one thing. My one thing. I start off. It was it was speaking. Like that was one thing. Even that, even if it wasn't profitable, that was that was my lane. That was my lane. That was the golden ticket for me. But 
it all started with just, just putting the action in the air. Like even Jay-Z, people look at Jay-Z now, all the stuff. But Jay-Z's first thing was drugs. Second thing was just music. And now he's evolved in those other areas. But I just challenge people to really self-evaluate to see like, do you really need that extra course? Do you need that training? Or are you just hard land because you really just don't want to put it out there? Why are you asking for opinions? Why are you asking for all this feedback? If I would ask for feedback and opinions on this live tour, nobody like that's nobody would have commented on and say, I want to see that. Because just 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 the way. But I put it out, put the tickets out, put this out, and and then now, okay, say if you want to do it by your dollars. Like that's 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 it. So it's just really cold hearted, straight facts. People really don't want what they say they want. They want to hide behind that that veil of I could do that. And um they gotta live with that. Do you think when you look at your life, do you think your groups have allowed you to evolve? I'm talking about family, friends, corporate positions. I know entrepreneurship will make you evolve, period. But <laughs> but do you think like your family, friends and previous companies have allowed you to grow into who you are? Heck yeah. They get first of all, they gave me grace. Like I've told you, like the my family, like there was a, there was a time at 25 years old, my dad was paying my rent and I was staying at his house. Like I did, cause I, I just had social anxiety. I didn't want to go back home. It's a lot of stuff going on. Like they gave me so much grace. Like I owed him everything. When, when society would have told me this is a 25 year old, he's had our success in the past. You need to tell him, get off the couch. I was on the couch for two months doing nothing. Like trying to just get like mentally straight. They held me down. Like without them, I'm nothing. Without my people that show up at this, like they, like I had zero credibility for a couple of years because I just mentally wasn't stable. I wasn't consistent. But people, my friends, supporters that, that buy my products now, whatever, they stayed true. They continued to support me because they knew it was never malicious. It's just I just had to get stuff straight. Corporate, corporate, they gave me the polish I needed to, to move. Like they gave me the blueprint on how business really runs. I just started using the blueprint now. But all those experiences are why my skill set is crazy. And plus to be in it. And this is the nugget for anybody who's listening. And every experience, I reflected one and I was present. Like, I think about it all the time. I was always present in what was going on. What am I learning? What is the skill set? What am I trying to get? So now my, my toolkit is so crazy. First of all, through God and grace. But I'm, I'm taking all my experiences into account. And a lot of people, just because they, they're younger, they don't take all the experiences into account. I'm taking account my childhood too. People say, okay, no, I got 14, 15 years of experience doing this. But I know people that have so much to offer, so great stories, so much, but they discredit what they got. Cause they like, cause they, they look at them barometers of what the world says is experience. Like, oh, I only have two years of experience on this corporate America. I don't have two years of experience. No, you got experiences when you work in that church group, experiences when you work with that dance group, experiences when you were working with your sisters trying to negotiate something on a doll or something like that. Like, don't discredit yourself. And um, that's why a lot of predatory people that, put online how to make a thousand dollars in a week i'm gonna teach you this training i'm gonna do all this stuff that's how they make money because they when you don't when you devalue yourself you'll 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 invest in somebody else to value themselves on a high level that's why you have so many quote-unquote gurus cashing out they ain't that deep it's because they just own who they are early and you just don't you, you just don't know who how much you have to offer in store so what were some of the i guess one or two specific corporate tools and systems that you're able to take and um, transfer that skill set into your business? Uh, the biggest, the, I guess I would say two. Uh, one, building a pipeline. I just started um, two months ago building a pipeline, like a cash pipeline for my business. I was in finance and I spent my first couple of years when I was struggling in business trying to build one off clients with that they really couldn't support what I was trying to do. So I was emailing principals, I was emailing teachers, trying to spend all that time and energy trying to get gigs that Max could pay me a hundred, hundred and fifty, maybe two hundred, maybe five, I don't know. And then I was like, if I really want to build an effective cash pipeline, let me spend my time working on the big fishes. Like so I can get those $2,500, $3,500 gigs so then I can do the free gigs for free. One email away, one phone call. Like, why am I spending all my time on the low-hanging fruit? Let me let me go for the big dogs. So if I were to change anything for my speaking career, just in general, start with the big fish first. And then a small fish, you can, you can do that to a certain extent. Um, the second thing I, I, I learned from my, my corporate experiences is just the value of positioning. 
value, like positioning and leverage. Now I kind of know what it's about. But just to see how big corporate entities like General Electric, Johnson and Johnson, BAE Systems, when they're when they're positioning contracts, how they they put together the slide decks, how they position themselves as market leaders and and things of that nature. Now, from a business perspective, I'm slowly and surely starting to integrate that when I pitch out now to to big businesses, to 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 general like people. So, I mean, the actual the methods and processes and how they secure big business and more so how important it is to have a cash pipeline, because if you don't have a cash pipeline, you don't have a business. And most importantly, to be real, if you don't have a business that's making money, you haven't you're operating a nonprofit. A lot of people offer I for a long time I was I had a nonprofit business that wasn't nonprofit. Like I was making no money. And I called my like a lot of people hanging around the CEO, entrepreneur, you ain't no entrepreneur because you don't have no team, you don't have no you have no cash line, you don't have no cash. So get the capital first, get it back. I tell them, gotta have that cash flow. Cash flow is real. Oh, so another thing that she stated I really appreciated was you were kind of back and forth between the corporate and the entrepreneurship thing. And I think lots of times people find it hard to, I guess, swallow their pride or to talk about that aspect. And I know when I quit four years ago, I'm like, I was all in because I feel like that's all I knew. But I'm starting to feel like the past two to three years, we've been talking a lot more about side hustle. Like it's okay to have a side hustle. It's okay to have that side business, you know, profitable hobby or whatever you want to call it. Um, But can you just speak to some of the transitions that you were going through when you were bouncing back and forth between corporate and entrepreneurship? Great question. I think there's two things that pull out. A, I was on one side, I was strategic. So I only went back to things that I really could add value in and I was going to get a different perspective. Like the first time I went back, I worked at Duke uh, Clinical Research. So I got a chance to work with um, some of the leading doctors in the world, work with an institution that gave me, I didn't get paid the most. Like at 21, I was making 60000 At 25, I made like 35000 at Duke. So I lost $25,000 and, and with more experience. But that experience, I interfaced with some of the top people in the world. And that gave me a, a different level of what professionalism looks like from a, a research perspective, uh, what what grants and whatnot. So I was strategic in that. And then after that, uh, after I jumped out, got hit in the head again, I went back into teaching because I knew strategically I wanted to see what it looks like to show up being consistent every single day. Even though I wanted the best speakers pound for pound under 30 in the country, to engage a classroom every single day for 90 minutes, uh, it's a science. Like it's, I, can, it's, I still don't even know how I did it this day. So that is else. And then also, but on the flip side, I realized it was out of necessity too. I can't, I couldn't serve anybody. Like ego aside, when you broke, when you have no money for food, I, I can't benefit nobody doing that. So I said, I had to get a job. So at the end of the day, like don't, don't hide behind and have to get a job. But once you get a job, once you get back, we need to go always continue building. I didn't mean I stopped. I didn't mean that I can't, I, I, I didn't, I just step, I just kept, 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 kept building while I was doing it. Adding, it's like business. You just got to keep adding more. I always put it like, a, it's like a table, right? When I first started, I had a, a, a leg in the middle of the table. So that's, that's not not stable. You're going to be falling everywhere. And then every single go around, the first book was another leg. The second book was the next leg. The podcast was the next leg. And now I got, I mean, I haven't even released when I'm really the really master, master plan. I got tables on legs, on legs, on legs. But it had to start every time I was working in those spaces, I, I created legs. And plus, I also had jobs where I didn't, it wasn't, I didn't have to have that much time on task. Like, dude, I got I, an hour, I can do the whole day's work. So best believe I was on the computer building, building, building. So um, it, but teaching, it was all hands on deck. That's a whole other story. So I could, you can't finesse teaching. But the, the corporate job, bro, every corporate job I ever had, I was doing what I needed to do. It only took an hour to do the work they need because, you know, corporate is inefficient. And their motto was so, like, big, especially more from big companies. No, oh, come on. Like, let's be real. Yeah, I mean, momentum is everything. Most, like, speed and momentum. And um, I don't know if you follow Gary Vee, but he speaks a lot on speed. But I'm like, it's not just about starting and finishing. It's like maintaining that momentum to, I mean, if you want to call it work-life balance, just balance health-wise, um, social balance. Uh, how have you been able to keep the momentum? Like you said, 
you know, first it was the book, the speaking, the podcast, like, how have you been able to, okay, now it's time to launch this project. I keep momentum by, I learned the game as uh, Julian Gordon. He has a book about goal setting. He's a phenomenal guy, phenomenal story. And he introduced a method to me about launching stuff publicly, paid stuff, book the venue publicly before you, before you actually do it to make sure you do it. Like I said, I did my book. I've put pre-sales up for my book before it was done. I had the book launch event already planned out, booked the venue before it was done. So now I've got so real with it where everything that I'm working on, I, for next couple years per se, I already kind of have contracts in place, stuff is out and I'm putting it out. So I have no choice but to be consistent. And and plus, I mean, and, and here's the nugget, here's the nugget, if anything you could take from it is everybody has weaknesses, right? So I put in habits and strategies to, to curtail that weakness here at case in point, let's get real practical. Some, I used to have struggles on the weekend staying really, really ultimately productive. So what I did was from seven to 9 AM, I have these calls where people that had one of the pick my brain people, I'm you going to, if you want it for free, it's going to be on my time. So I have like an hour and a half, two hours where I just have calls every Saturday. So me just getting in that, that rhythm of constantly adding value, talking to people, growing my network. By the time that 9 AM junk, I'm on fire. Like I done gave two hours of dope content or I didn't get, I received something. I had no choice but be productive because my mind is already revved up. A, my mind is revved up and two, I'm getting more reps. Like I'm getting so many more reps, people. Cause like it, I don't need to really practice no more of a speaking thing because I get so many reps. I don't need to prepare like that no more. So I'm getting my reps in and I'm also counteracting weakness because the Saturday thing, right? Even in my mornings, my mornings, I got called. Today I had calls from like 530. I don't always do this, but I have I have certain everything in my schedule is intentional. And I just try to make sure that um, I intentionally put stuff out way ahead of time so I can see that pipeline going. And also the last thing, last thing, I always follow blueprint and I from every industry. And I think Drake has one of the best blueprints out of in the summertime. He does this tour. He drops the albums around the same time he does that. So I kind of have my I have my I call it my Drake cycle where from here on out, uh, the conference is going to happen every March every year, right? The minority trailblazers. I'm every summer I'm going on tour. I'm dropping a book at the same time every wave. I'm dropping the album every single year at the same time. So I have my own cycle where, and plus, luckily, in the day, it ain't all about me. Like I'm interviewing people, right? So it's not like people ain't. You can't. You can get sick of Greg, but I'm 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 showcasing everybody else. So. Uh, yeah, now just, it's just having a model, having a framework and most importantly, executing without validation. Wow. I like it. Um, okay. So you have the tour. I'm in Houston, uh, Saturday, July 29th. You're going to be here. Uh, what, what can people expect from the tour? Man, I really, (laughs) they can expect a lot, a, a lot of value for twenty dollar price point, and I'm I can get real specific on this call because I've been I've been essentially vague as far as details about the tour. It's more so you got to be there to experience it. But I'll give you a nugget: the way we're doing the tour from two to four, I have a private session. It was originally three to four, but I realized first three states. Remember adjustment, adjustment, adjustment. I realized that three to four. Um, intentional networking session where people had picked my brain about speaking, podcasting, writing books, all that stuff was not enough time. So now it's going to be actually from two to four. So people can pay an increased price point from two to four. Ask me anything about public speaking, marketing, whatever. And I'm taking them right behind the scenes, like computer screenshots. You can look at my Facebook ads, how I place them out, LinkedIn, how I market it, everything you want to know. You come there, I'm going to give it to you. From four to five, where majority of people are going to be for the live podcast, um, from four to five, and uh, we're gonna have the live podcast. We're probably gonna start around four fifteen because traffic and all this other stuff. So four fifteen to five fifteen live podcast. I'll be uh, interviewing Toby Ingo. I can't say his last name. After last name, uh, he's a he's signed on Eric Thomas Records. Uh, he's a as a huge huge influencer in Houston. Motivational speaker, rapper, uh, creative. We're going to dig deep into some topics. Then from 5.15 to 6 o'clock, I'm having a segment called PSA where I have three speakers lined up and they're going to talk about three subjects. 
uh, 10 minutes a piece. So DC, we had like faith, confidence, failure. Atlanta, we had duality, uh, mentality and growth. Um, Houston, we got some real soft, soft, like soft skill topics, but some real nitty gritty stuff because my podcast is based off of authenticity. So we're going to have that. And then the last section we have from uh, six o'clock to seven and usually Every city is going over to like 839. Crazy. It's called the Four Corners of Networking. So in each corner, there'll be a content or a, or a ambassador of a small business life, whatever, I mean, in each city that is going to be curating conversation and just getting that networking piece. And they'll switch corners every 15 minutes. So that's the framework that's been working with us. We're going to take that framework on the road. It's been rock solid. So it's for twenty dollars. You can't beat that. Like there's no other way. Like so if you're in Houston, you need to make your way out there. There's only 80. I'm only it's going only 80 people can fit. So we'll probably have around like eh, 60, 70, 50, 70. I don't know. Um, but whoever's there, even though there was it can't be 10. We already sold out of pre-sales and everything, everything of that nature. But I don't care who's in the building. It's going to be a crazy value add. Make sure you attend. And that's a wrap up for that uh, for that event. I love it. I love it. I will definitely be there. I just bought my ticket today. So I didn't realize the time went by so fast, but um, I just want you to drop a few things, whether it's about your book, Remember remember Your Genius, um, your podcast, and where can people find you? All right, cool. You can find the book, greggyhill.com backslash book, Remember Your Genius. That's all the nuts and crannies of my whole story, everything. And I got so many jewels and principles in there. So make sure you you check that out. Uh, find out about the tour, greggyhill.com backslash MTP live. You can look at the Instagram, Gregory Hill, Twitter, Gregory Hill, Facebook, Gregory E. Hill, Snapchat, Gregory E. Hill. All the information is at my website. So um, you can find out all that. On the lookout, of course, we got Houston, July 29th. August 5th, we got Brooklyn, New York. August 12th, we got my home city, Durham, North Carolina. I got an album coming out September uh, in March 2018, Minority Trailblazer Conference, which we're going to talk offline. I definitely, Michelle, you're going to be involved in some capacity in that. It's going to be huge, 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 no fluff, all facts, motivational, strategic from from the, the, the influencers of today. And it's just going to be crazy, 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 crazy. So more information on that is at MinorityTrailblazer.com. I think that's all I really got right now. Man, I just want to say I appreciate you. I respect your hustle. Um, just proud of you, man. I'm just proud of you. And um, just to meet you at this point, um, I know you've been doing this for a minute, but to meet you at this point, to see the success um, and just to be, you know, within the pack, it means a lot to me. And I look forward to a lot more. Uh, before we wrap up, the final question how do you define success? Mm, by not letting success define me. Got to elaborate. I don't, I don't. There's no. There's no limits. There's no nothing. There's no. There's no landmark. When I hit a million or something like that, nobody's gonna be like, "Hey, Greg Hill, you're following success." No, nah, I don't care about all that. I just care about executing. Because at the end of the day, to be honest, all this is vanity, anyways. Um, I'm just doing something to fulfill my time on earth, add value, hopefully change a couple lives, but. And then it is when I when I when I and I'm not gonna lean too much in the faith because I don't know where everybody's at religiously. But what I believe in when I, when I all said and done when I die, yeah, I mean just the person that they gave their life that worked at Kmart, we gonna get the same reception. So I'm not it ain't gonna be like God ain't gonna be like yo G Hill bro like you change the world yo bro you go you get VIP the package this no I, I, everything ain't that deep. So that's why it's like when I had that mindset. Like you just go with the energy, go with the flow. So I don't let, I'm not on that success tip. I'm on just, just work, execute and live the life you're called to live. But I, with that being said, everybody don't have to be an entrepreneur. Everybody don't have to be again. No, just look, what makes you happy. What, what, where your, where your energy flows. If you're, you feel you're called to do your own thing, do your own thing. But you feel you're called to be a, a home wife or work at corporate, work at corporate. I'm not like one of them guys that going to demean you for not following your dreams or you should be doing this. No, everybody can't be Gary V. Like everybody can't lead LeBron James. Everybody can't be Michelle. No, like nobody, nobody can't do that. So, like, just own where you at, and keep your blinders on. The reason, and I'll leave y'all with this nugget: the reason why horses in the Kentucky Derby run fast, they run strong, they're just game changers. And the reason why is because they have blinders on. They don't look at anybody else. They just run in their own race. So imagine what the world would look like. Imagine what your life would look like if you just put the blinders on and ran your own race. 
it, it, it would be so much powerful if you weren't trying to be somebody's boss. So you weren't trying to teach nobody this. You weren't trying to impress this. You weren't trying to have babies just to have babies or make, get married just to have married. If you just trying to live your life, put your blinders on, you will be happy. You probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast. You'd be executing some jewels a day and then ramble too much. But this is what the life is all about, man. Don't let success define you. I love it. I love it. Hey, good people. Remember, I believe in you. Personal connection leads to an influential network. So thanks for networking with Michelle.